you to participants. Okay, sure. Uh, Dr. Hamid is clinical professor and consultant in otology, neurotology, and audiovestibular medicine and science. His career started as an electrical engineer from Ayn Shams University in Egypt. He joined Mbaba Hearing and Speech Center as an audiological engineer. After training in audiological science in Denmark, he moved on to do PhD on vestibular neuroscience at Imperial College, then was asked to head Cleveland Clinic Vestibular Center while completing his MD at Case University in Cleveland, Ohio. Post MD training was combined the program of ENT, neuro, neurology, and internal medicine. He founded the Cleveland and Hearing and Balance Center in 1996 and is still practicing in Cleveland, Ohio. You can start now. Thank you, Vera. And it's a pleasure to be. Most with your group again, uh, just want to uh, uh, say that uh, the Auditory and Vestibular Medicine International Board, uh, let me just uh, put my phone on silent here, right. okay, um, is a, um, um, a, a relatively new uh, group when they focus on auditory vestibular medicine education training and hopefully eventually would develop an international board because there is no international board certification in auditory and vestibular medicine so keep, keep that in mind um i have 30 slides and i should be able to finish them within 45 minutes uh, the outline is, I'm going to talk about demographics and the burden of subjective tinnitus. We're not going to be talking about objective tinnitus. That might be for a different webinar. I'm also going to talk about something that I gained from my uh, experience, which is the physicians and patients' perspectives about tinnitus. Uh, Briefly talk about subjective tinnitus pathogenesis or really underlying neurophysiology. Talk about clinical evaluation and we'll take questions and answers after that. You can text your questions and answers through the Zoom chat or if you have a specific even case <clears throat> that you would like um, to kind of elaborate and discuss more, you can email it to AV mib11 at gmail.com. Um, the prevalence of tinnitus, depending who you read to and who you talk to, goes anywhere between 15 to 40 percent of any given population. Tinnitus, subjective tinnitus, is frequently associated with sensory neural hearing loss, which primarily is at the risk factors of sensory neural hearing loss age, the male sex, and noise exposure. 35% or even more of hearing loss is present in subjects over 65 years old. We normally lose about 5% of auditory neurons across the entire auditory pathway, uh, about 5% uh, on an annual basis. In terms of noise, I'm sure we all know our world has become a very noisy place and noise induced hearing loss continues to be a major problem. Now, what um, uh, patients have significant physical, emotional and psychiatric burdens. We all know that. In addition, significant disability, a lot of people with tinnitus uh, severe tinnitus particularly apply for disability, particularly the veteran uh, administration because of uh, the uh, noise exposure in the, in, in the service, uh, obviously. Post-concussion syndrome, post-traumatic stress syndromes as well. We all know that there is no effective treatments, let alone a cure. Patients usually is there a cure for tinnitus? And obviously there isn't. The focus, however, in approach to tinnitus uh, worldwide is reducing the intensity with the hope uh, to uh, 
uh, this is not recused. Uh, rec uh, it's to reduce secondary effects of tinnitus. Okay. Uh, just need to note note things to be changed later on. All right. Um, the other thing is, as I'm sure most of you, particularly the senior uh, physicians, there is a significant variations among practices of tinnitus clinics worldwide. In my traveling, since I started in, in attending meetings and what have you, the uh, clinics that supposedly call themselves tinnitus clinics vary considerably in terms of staff, qualifications and background, uh, the way they evaluate these patients, and also the way these patients are treated. Tinnitus patients require team approach from physicians and scientists, psychologists, and psychiatrists as well. We'll talk about that later on. Patients themselves are really desperate and furthermore, vulnerable probably to a lot of unproven treatments based on testimonials uh, where uh, patients are just giving their opinion that yes, that drug, that machine or what have you has helped my, my, my tinnitus. Remember the placebo effect is about 30% in any given uh, medical population and in any given disease disorder or what have you. Doctor, I'm sorry, but there is some noise in with sound. I'm sorry? The patients are vulnerable. Uh, is that okay? I don't want to sound as if I'm shouting at everybody. All right. that, that, my is voice okay? volume is okay? Okay. All right. Uh, so patients are vulnerable to uh, unproven uh, treatments and in fact, Right at the beginning here, there is no specific drug for tinnitus per se, but there are drugs that would help with the secondary effects of tinnitus. Um, the tinnitus remains a challenge to patients and physicians, and both sides are not really satisfied with the current options of treatment. And as, you sh as, as I'm sure you know, uh, people use sound masters, most commonly used option for managing tinnitus, CBT, cognitive brain therapy, that's like a psychotherapy, uh, CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, RTMS, that's a transmagnetic stimulation, anti-anxiety, anti antidepressant, self-help therapy, uh, group therapy, so many things, hyperbaric oxygen, Name it, you will find it. Even there is some, something called the tinny tool where they use um, uh, laser, um, but there is no clinical trials to support any of these uh, treatments. The cost is significant. It, in the United States, the cost of evaluating a tinnitus patient goes between 700 to 2,000 per patient per visit. Um, Research funding is limited by comparison to other disorders, for example, pain and anxiety and depression. And the pharmaceutical industry is not really motivated to um, develop any um, programs to develop drugs dedicated to tinnitus because neurophysiologically, you cannot pinpoint one area of receptors or one area, targeted area where Medications can be helpful. We'll talk about that as well. So, what are the physicians and patients' perspectives? There is evident disconnect. And disconnect, kind of a a, 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 a neutral word uh, that each side is mad at, at the other side. The physicians are not happy, and I will tell you why that is. And the patients are not happy. The patients are not happy because they're not getting treatment. They're not getting rid of the tinnitus. So sometimes the patient would, uh, the doctor would say in her or his mind, oh my God, here's another tinnitus patient uh, coming through my office. The patient is going to the doctor saying, they come to me and say, Dr. Hamid, you're my last hope. When you hear that, 
your kind of heart sinks down in your feet. Um, the doctor always say, I don't have time for these patients. Well, the patient really want more time because they want to elaborate. They want to explain what the stimulus is doing to their life. The doctor would say, I don't have a treatment. Uh, the patients usually ask why. Why don't you, you as a uh, physician, scientist and everything, uh, give us some hope? And the last thing that I really would encourage everybody to avoid is when you say to the patient, listen, um, we ruled out any major medical problem. You don't have a tumor. You're not losing your mind. Learn to live with it. If that is what you're going to tell the patient, the patient will tell you, why that? Am I going crazy? So be careful using uh, the word learn to live with it, which, by the way, is very common worldwide. Um, particularly ENT physicians say, you know what? Uh, listen, you, you, you just have to learn with it. That, that's a pretty heavy statement to tell the patients. Unfortunately, we, meaning physicians uh, and uh, scientists, uh, have not been able to run tinnitus clinics in such a way that would inspire, actually, trust and engagement with the tinnitus patients. Hearing loss patients is different. Vertigo is different. But tinnitus patients particularly uh, fall into this uh, category. Um, and so the patient usually would ask, what's wrong with me? Who are those am I seeing? Because as I'm sure you know, there are a lot of people who claim they can see and manage tinnitus patients all over the world. Europe, United States, Africa, Asia, everywhere. They don't necessarily see physicians or scientists with solid background and training in that particular area. The question also is, okay, I've seen 15, 20 patients, uh, physicians and doctors, facilities, physical therapists, psychotherapists, but who should I see? That's another question patients ask. The other thing is, is the healthcare system taking care of us? That's important. Healthcare system resources are becoming shorter and shorter, and they focus on much more serious diseases. Well, I'm sure most of us would appreciate that a patient presenting with a major cancer for the same sacred discussion is going to get more resources from the system than a patient presenting with chronic uh, tinnitus. So what do the physicians, what do we physicians, I remember asking these questions way before I did my PhD or training. We need to understand really the neurophysiology and neuropsychology of tinnitus. We're still working on that. We have learned a lot more, but we're still far from a complete understanding of what we call applicable biopsychosocial model, meaning to integrate the biology, the psychology, and the social aspects of tinnitus into any model of evaluation and, and treatment. So the current state of affairs is, we have significant research and scientific advances, for sure. A lot of research is being done in the area of tinnitus. However, there is very little changes in the clinical training approaches and or treatment. Just I want everybody to reflect on your own training and how much really training you had in tinnitus or even vertigo. That's a different subject altogether. Because of that, it's a vicious cycle, further disconnect between patients and physicians. The other thing is, there are animal models. Unfortunately, they don't have direct translation to human applications. I'm going back to the training, even post-MDs, post-PhDs, post the so-called science audiology training or certification. 
we must focus our effort to get an effective treatment modality with at least 60 to 70 percent efficacy. Short of that, I don't think that tinnitus patients will uh, be happy and we will continue to be frustrated and disappointed. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanism or pathogenesis. The word pathogenesis implies that you're dealing with a disease. Tinnitus is not a disease. It is a symptom. So we need to talk about the mechanism of that. We're not going to find a virus or a bacteria that is going to be directly related to causing tinnitus. Okay. Well, you can have viral hearing loss and the hearing loss leading to tinnitus, but treating that virus is not necessarily going to treat the tinnitus. The most common accepted uh, mechanism is when the hearing loss is fixed, that is a deafferination of the cochlea and the eighth nerve, and that leads to a paradoxical increase in the central hyperactivity of the auditory pathway neurons. You would think that it would decrease, but it doesn't. And that has been proven in animal experiments. That's a paradoxical concept until we find uh, an alternative explanation to what's going on. And uh, the computer modeling uh, and the animal study showed uh, a reorganization in the uh, central auditory pathway neurons, increasing the spontaneous activity firing of all neurons at the brain stem, particularly the dorsal cochlear nucleus, midbrain, at the um, uh, 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 I'm marking on where the midbrain, the thalamus, and the auditory uh, cortex as well. The recent um, webinar by Professor. Uh, uh, Noreen, I'm from France. He has an excellent lab, actually, and they have quite a bit of uh, information about the subject. So look up the papers that comes from their uh, place. The research continues trying to elucidate the tinnitus mechanisms. All right, clinical approach. Well, take a history and do exam. You know that from studying medicine for years. So you take the history of disease, hearing loss, acoustic trauma, autotoxic medication is very important. And then you ask the specific questions about the tinnitus, perceived pitch and loudness. And that's important because if the loudness, if the perceived loudness is way above the thresholds of the pure tone, you would suspect that there could be some psychological component in the suppressiveness of the uh, tinnitus. And the psychological impacts, you ask about um, anxiety, depression, and more important, sleep. If tinnitus patients don't get a good night's sleep, the next day tinnitus is gonna be probably 50 to 100 times louder. You do a rheumatologic exam, probably with a microscope, especially if they've had some surgery or chronic ear disease. Use the tuning forks, very important. And when you're using the tuning forks, you can actually ask the question, does this sound like your own tinnitus? We're not trying to find out if they have tonal tinnitus, but whatever they're hearing, because it's subjective, we cannot hear it that will give you a, uh, a little bit of information. You can have a noise box around you, small handheld noise generator, and you can generate either narrowband noise, white noise, pink noise, and get an idea where uh, the subjective tinnitus uh, is close to. And while you're doing that, you could actually find out if that would mask their own tinnitus. We're gonna talk about residual inhibition. One of the questions I usually ask is, 
when it's really um, more loud, and usually in a quiet environment, when you take a shower in the morning, do you hear your own tinnitus? Most big patients say no. That actually tells you that tinnitus can be uh, masked with uh, white noise because the shower noise is almost a white noise. Exam, um, again, tuning fork. This is a normal ear. Here's an ear with early otitis media. You can see the bubbles behind the eardrum if you can see that. If you have a good microscope, you would see that. That would give you a little bit of tinnitus. We all have tinnitus. I don't know how many of you went to the pretty good um, uh, uh, sound booth and if you stay there for a few minutes, you would begin to feel that there is some, what I call natural tinnitus there. You hear it when it's totally quiet around you. Uh, so when you have a conductive hearing loss as a result of that serious otitis media, that allows the brain to hear the uh, cochlear uh, baseline, if you will, uh, activities much higher. That's a chronic ear uh, where the tympanic membrane is literally stuck on the promontory. It is a, a perforation. And those three ears would definitely have tinnitus for good reasons. And to the part that most um, us uh, fall to evaluation, you do an audiometry, pure tone, speech, tympanometries. Also, so there is some, I don't do the very high frequency, but if you do 8 and 12, and 12 is absent, you know that anything past 12 is not going to be there. And then the so-called threshold equalizing noise. That is the concept that was introduced by Professor Moore from England. He's a psychoacoustician, and he would be coming actually on one of the future webinars to talk about cochlear dead region and how they impact the uh, psychoacoustics and, and so forth. You, you would be getting information about this. Just to remember that not all high frequency sensory nor hearing loss is the same. Tinnitus would be different depending on, again, the biopsychosocial uh, model. You do tinnitus matching in terms of the frequency, uh, central frequency, if you're going to use narrow band or the white noise, and the decibel at which the patients, and patients are pretty good at really saying that. Oh, yeah, that, that's similar to mine, and it's, it's less, it's gone, all right? And um, as I said, if the level of masking is within five to 10 decibels of the uh, pure tone threshold, that, that makes it a, a, a little bit more, uh, quote unquote, true uh, subjective tinnitus. Whereas if the level is say 60, 70 decibels, that doesn't make sense physiologically. And then you, and pretty much uh, be sure that there is a psychological component into the perception of, of that tinnitus. And then you do residual inhibition. Residual inhibition, you inhibit the tinnitus, you stop, and you see how long the patients will hear it afterwards. Uh, there is a lot of work done in the residual inhibition. Generally speaking, if there is a residual inhibition, those patients will probably do better with masters than if you don't have residual inhibition. And would also expect that those who do not have residual uh, inhibition would have a little bit of um, uh, what we call the uh, hyperacusis uh, phenomenon. Imaging, the only imaging that I do when it comes to tears is MRI with contrast in the asymmetric setting sense in your hearing loss to make sure that they don't have a, an acoustic tumor or more correctly, vestibular schwannoma. Um, in my practice, um, and the people who work with me, we don't do any 
uh, more tests. Actually, uh, I should in have included auto fiscal commission in, uh, in this slide because we do uh, auto fiscal commission. So allow me to do that. Uh, to do that here. Uh, because the auto person commission is beneficial. Uh, it's going to tell you the uh, auto hair cell function. And, and again, you incorporate that into the management. Because if, if you have uh, normal, if you have auto person commission, uh, these patients probably would benefit from uh, intertympanic perfusion with dexamethasone. And I'll come back to that in, in, a, in a little bit of time. So you do a history, a physical exam, and then what is your differential diagnosis? It's important to decide, am I dealing with acute versus chronic tinnitus? With chronic tinnitus, the central reorganization is much more set, whereas with the acute tinnitus, the, the central reorganization could be kind of in, in process and you may be able to interrupt it uh, not necessarily all the time so that that's important also the psychological impact of tinnitus acutely are going to be very different than chronically there is a little bit of an adaptive mechanism when things continue uh, for a little bit longer time is it idiopathic spontaneous tinnitus? Well, that's really what subductive tinnitus is all about. Is an acoustic trauma. Is it age-related hearing loss by itself or with an added extra factor? For example, the elderly population who uh, would go uh, hunting, use uh, Guns without ear protection, uh, ride motorcycles without ear protection, uh, boats, motorboats without ear protection. And that would add to the age-related uh, uh, hearing loss and subsequently tinnitus. The other thing is medications. A lot of um, elderly population now are drifting to get uh, the uh, uh, five phosphodiesterase inhibitors, that, that is the enzyme in the prostate and for benign prostate hypertrophy, and also for sexual dysfunction for women as well as men, by the way. So you need to ask about that because uh, the Viagra and the like would lead to visual and hearing loss as well. Uh, amino glycosides, obviously, uh, like genomycin and what have you. Is it acoustic tumor? Is it part of many years disease, migraine, or autoimmune, the so-called hydrophic tinnitus, a dysfunction of the stria vascularis uh, metabolic pathway? So that's your differential diagnosis. Management. <clears throat> 